It's now my pleasure to introduce our commencement speaker, Dr. DJ Patil, is currently Vice President of Products at Relate IQ. He has held a variety of roles in academia, industry, and government. These include Chief Scientist, Chief Security Officer, and Head of Analytics and Data Products um, at teams at LinkedIn Corporation. Additionally, he has held a number of roles at Skype, PayPal, and eBay. He is known for co-coining the term data scientist. In, t in 2011, he was ranked on the Forbes data scientist list as number two behind Larry Page. As a, as a member of the faculty at the University of Maryland, his research focused on nonlinear dynamics and chaos theory, and he helped start a major research initiative on numerical weather prediction. As a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow for the Department of Defense, Dr. Patil directed new efforts to leverage social network analysis and the melding of computational and social sciences to anticipate emerging threats to the United States. He has also co-chaired a major review of U.S. efforts to prevent bioweapons proliferation in Central Asia and he co-founded the Iraqi Virtual Science Library. Let's all welcome Dr. DJ Patil. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Ramirez, the distinguished faculty here today. And thank you to all the friends and family who have come out to celebrate this day. Thank you for all being here. Most importantly, you, the class of 2014, you guys look pretty damn awesome. <laughs> Good thing to social media, you'll find those later. <laughs> All right, so I recognize that I'm the person standing between you and a selfie with your diploma. So I'm going to do my best to keep it short, and I'm going to start with a confession. Ever since Professor Gitor reached out and asked me if I'd be willing to do this, I've been dreading it. I mean, really dreading it. I mean, as in final exam of 206, <laughs> dreading it. Compilers dreading it. <laughs> yeah, you guys know what I mean. <laughs> Here's why. I grew up just over the hill, so it's safe to say I'm intimately familiar with your UC Santa Cruz lifestyle you've been leading. In fact, in high school, I used to play volleyball just over there in volleyball tournaments. And since it's so close, my dad is here to watch me give this talk, and a talk for the first time in 20 years since high school. And next to him are my kids so they can get the first-hand commentary. Along with them is my mom, my wife, and mother-in-law. So if this doesn't go very well, it's going to be one long drive home. <laughs> so here we go. Now, now that you're about to graduate from this incredible institution, I want you to think back to the first real interaction you had with UC Santa Cruz. Do you even remember how long it took you to fill out that application? Those essays? Do you remember that day you were accepted here? I want you to picture where you actually were when you found out you were accepted. Because back in my day, admission letters were sent by banana slug mail, and I perfectly remember receiving that first envelope. In it was a single sheet of paper telling me, thanks, but no thanks. And this taught me an incredible life lesson. Good things don't come in thin envelopes. <laughs> Rejection hurts. I mean, really hurts. And I, I really wanted to blame everyone for not seeing or valuing my raw awesomeness. But the truth was, the problem was me. To say I was a challenge growing up was putting it a little lightly. And it's not really a surprise that I was rejected. After all, I'd been suspended, kicked out of my math class, and read my rights. And that was just in the first six months of high school. 
By the time I was graduating, my, high, my grades were so poor, along with my SAT scores, that I, I put me literally at the bottom of my high school. So I didn't just get one thin envelope, I had a whole giant stack of them. And I remember sitting in my room, staring at them, wondering what I did, would do next, and thinking how impressive, how literally soul-crushing the weight of so many no's can be. I admit, I cried. Lots. Not knowing what else to do, I decided to ask the one person I swore I would never, ever admit weakness to. My dad. His advice? Why don't you just call up the universities? Now you know why I don't like his advice. <laughs> but with no other options, that's just what I did. And with no real plan in place, I started dialing numbers. And I know I sounded like an idiot because I didn't even know what to ask for. But after many, many tries, I finally reached a sympathetic lady at UCSD who asked me a really simple question. Why don't you just appeal? I mean, who knew you could appeal? She gave me some details, and I put my heart and soul into getting people to write letters for me. And I spent more time writing my appeal letter than I did on any college essay. <laughs> Six weeks later, a new letter showed up at my house. This time, the envelope was big and heavy. Everyone I knew was stunned, except for one guy, my dad. While the rest thought no was a final word, he knew that it was just the beginning of the conversation. And this realization taught me one of the most important principles in taking on really hard problems. There are no rules, only guidelines. Here's why this is so important. There's a dirty little secret out there and no one is telling you about it. You're all about to receive this great piece of paper that's gonna look awesome framed on your wall and it certifies you to, that you are imminently qualified to update your LinkedIn profile. <laughs> And armed with this diploma, you're going to find a world filled with people whose first and last word to you will be no. Class of 2014, I'm not going to lie to you. At some point in your life, the weight of all those no's you are going to receive will be soul crushing. Chase your big ideas. Expect the no's, but do not accept the no's. Find reasons to turn those no's into yeses. And when you have the opportunity to do so, Find reasons to say yes to others. Because at the end of the day, there are no rules, only guidelines. I was fortunate enough to work for the US government during a pause in my academic career. And I had two colleagues who were incredibly passionate about the civilians in Iraq. It was still early in the war. And one of the big problems with the Iraqi educational system was that it was 40 years behind the ones you're about to graduate from. Literally, their most recent textbooks were 40 years older than the ones you've been trying to figure out how to stuff in a box and ship home. That means their dental care, neonatal care, and agricultural techniques were stuck in the 1970s. So take a moment and ask yourself, you guys are engineers. What does it really take to put a modern library in a place like Iraq? Well, first off, it's in a war zone. Second, books are really, really heavy, so moving them is hard. And as you know from the campus bookstore, they're pretty expensive. <laughs> Turns out, they're flammable too. <laughs> Have you ever met a person from Iraq? Because I hadn't. So many good reasons to say no. But there was one yes. Online courses had just started and the transition to electronic journals were well underway. So it just made sense to do everything electronically. <laughs> All we needed to do was make sure they had access to the internet. We found out there was a high-speed fiber connection into Iraq. The only problem was the line ran through Kuwait, and they wouldn't turn it on until Iraq had paid the war reparations. So we tried to track down the guy responsible for the Iraqi internet domains, the .iq. And we did, in a jail cell in Texas, serving a long sentence. More and more no's. So while in a funk about that project, I happened to be talking to a colleague a former tank commander in Iraq, about the chaos sur surrounding the whole project. And he looked me dead in the eye and he said, I love chaos, because from chaos comes opportunity. And this has become one of my mantras, because being a guy who spent his entire academic career working on chaos theory, it's not very often that I'm left speechless on the topic. But he was right. We were only looking for reasons to say no, we hadn't been looking for enough reasons to say yes. So we got to work. 
but this time with baby steps. One of our team members located a Rocky faculty member through sheer will and dedication. Once we were able to establish contact, we found that they loved using Skype in cyber cafes through internet satellite feeds. Unfortunately, we were working in a secured facility in Washington, D.C., so we'd drive to the local coffee shops and use their free Wi-Fi with our personal laptops to talk to them. But the no's kept coming. Now they were fancier. Words like authorization, oversight, jurisdiction, good old pushing meetings out. The bureaucracy we were working in was designed to say no. One of our team members figured out, hey, how bad would it be if he wrote a memo to his, let's see, Uber, 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 Uber boss. That would be the Secretary of State. It was a long shot, but we figured, what the heck, we're running low on options. And so a few weeks later, we were in a meeting and he pulled out a thin envelope out of his bag. So I was naturally freaking out. <laughs> in it, the original memo, and at the bottom, handwritten with emphasis, G-O-O-D, exclamation mark, good. It's like we had gotten a gold star on a homework assignment. <laughs> but then, magically, people started to align with our goals. By getting one powerful person to buy into our vision, we were able to move from no conversations to how conversations. It was no longer a pet project, it was a combined effort. And this taught me how important it is to go from me to we if you're going to try to do something hard. Unfortunately, getting to yes often comes at a great cost. As hard as it was for us, the risk taken by our soldiers, our diplomats, the Rocky scientists and educators were substantially greater. We lost more than I'd like to count to the war, and as the gravity of the situation sank in, we needed to go faster. Our philosophy became, don't ask for permission, beg for forgiveness, because getting all those green lights would be an eventual slow death. Finally, the system was ready to go, and we got to see the impact. And I cried. Not because of the soul-crushing no's, this time it was a thank yous. The stories of the people who use that system to make a difference. And now that program we started, I'm so proud to be able to say that it's a backbone of their educational system. And that's why the recent news out of Iraq is so heart-wrenching for me. Because the people I worked with, I am confident, will continue to find ways to fight to say yes for the country, their children, and a better life. Class of 2014, do not fear chaos or run from it. Run towards the chaos, and you will guarantee, I guarantee you, you will discover incredible opportunities. We live in a culture where it is all too easy to say no. Instead, adopt a philosophy of begging for forgiveness instead of asking for permission. When looking to solve new problems, ask people to engage in how conversations instead of no ones. Most of all, lead a path of intellectual honesty. It's easy to get wrapped up in the passion of an idea, but if you're not brutally honest with yourselves and the people you're working with, you will set yourself up for failure by creating a delusional environment. Part of being intellectually honest is to anticipate failure. Know this and expect it by formulating hypotheses you can test. Your training here, the training you have gotten over the last few years at the Baskin School has prepared you incredibly well for this. You spent a critical portion of your life applying the scientific method to your work. Now apply it to your broader life. If you do this, you will move faster from no to yes. As you test your ideas, know that you are not going to get it right the first time, the second time, or even the third. Instead, focus on iterating from hypothesis to hypothesis. Let the scientific method be your guide, and it will never, ever let you down or fail you. The key to this is the speed at which you iterate. At the end of the day, ask yourself, are you massively smarter than you were yesterday? It's okay if you bombed, as long as you are 10x smarter. You all know how compound interest works with money. Now apply that to yourselves with experience and knowledge. Make sure you're investing in yourself this way, and I guarantee you that you will eventually look back at how far you've come and be stunned at the progress. You've already seen it happen. That's what this university is about. Think back to that first day on campus where you didn't even know where the bathroom was. 
Remember how hard that first homework set was as you sat there staring blankly at the page, not even knowing who to call? The struggle that you took? Now this stuff is elementary. It's stunning how far you've come. Do not ever forget it. And it's not just the university that got you here. One of the most important things you will need in figuring out how hard problems are the people you're sitting next to. And all these guys out here, here to celebrate today with you. These are your tribe, your people, the ones you will be able to count on in your darkest hour. These are the people who will be the first to drop whatever they're doing to pick you back up. Equally, they are the ones who will keep you honest when you go off course. They will be your compass for a path of intellectual honesty. Make sure to cherish and nurture those relationships and recognize the reciprocity that is required to keep your tribe vibrant. You only succeed if you all succeed. When I was in the third grade, they had a career day, and I asked my father what he did. He told me he was an entrepreneur. Now to put that in perspective, I was eight and still working on how to say aluminum. <laughs> and I remember being on the jungle gym, and it was recess, and the kids did that classic start one-upping each other, what their parents did, teacher, accountant, policeman, fireman. And the only thing that happened is I mangled the word entrepreneur was laughter. Man, I couldn't believe how uncool my dad made me. <laughs> this went on year after year. As he worked on his ideas, raw struggle, and watching him, I learned that entrepreneurship is one of the best ways to say yes to crazy and unbelievable ideas. As the saying goes, entrepreneurship is like jumping off a cliff and building a plane before you hit the, gra before you hit the ground. I think that embodies the best in fighting every instinct to say no. After a decade, I got to see his company go public. And through the press, I finally realized what a powerful impact his crazy fight for yes had on so many lives. In fact, all of your lives. It turns out he's the Baskin School's longest serving advisor, but no one just figured that out until just a little while ago. Turns out entrepreneurship is cool. <laughs> Watching him go through that journey and being lucky enough to go through my own path, I've learned that in order to break boundaries and constantly find ways to innovate, you have to focus on creating more value than you take. Always give more than you take. For every one unit you take, create 10x the, to return. It can be for every one dollar you make, create ten dollars of value. Or for every one hour of mentorship you get, provide 10 hours of mentorship. When you give more than you take, we're gonna all benefit and make this world better. That's how you create your tribe. That's how you get people to help you when you jump off that cliff and gotta build that plane. Once you've jumped, remember this advice. Clever beats smart, wisdom beats experience. Clever beats smart, wisdom beats experience. Smart is important, but clever will beat smart nine times out of 10. If you're working on a hard problem, clever approaches will allow you to iterate fast. Once you've figured it out, then focus on smart because it'll help you scale and solidify the idea. Clever is agility and smart is horsepower. How do you get to clever? Most people would say it's through experience. In reality, that's only part of the solution. There's a big difference between experience and wisdom. Experience will allow you to make the same mistake over and over again. Wisdom is gained upon reflection of that experience. Make sure you take the time in your incredibly busy lives to digest your experiences and turn them into wisdom. There you have it, class of 2014. My advice to you. Number one, live a life of intellectual honesty. Two, create more than you take. Three, clever beats smart, wisdom beats experience. And on this Father's Day, please take some time to reflect on those experiences with dad or any father figure to turn them into wisdom. Remember to say thank you to those who have helped you fight for yes and who will fight for your yeses. It could be your dad, your mom, a mentor, your spouse, a sibling, or even your kids. Let's take a moment today to thank all those here 
who helped you get here, especially you dads and father figures out there. You know, my father used to always tell me I'd be good at math, literally, even though I kept failing at it, literally. And for 18 years, I found a way to say no, because it was a hard path. So dad, now that my career is math, thank you for fighting for yes. And when my kids ask me what I do, I'm proud to tell them that I'm an entrepreneur. But before career day, I'm gonna make sure they can say it and spell it. <laughs> Class of 2014, you've met the criteria to be here today to wear this regalia from what is, it, in my opinion, one of the best programs in the world. How do I know? Because it's my favorite program to hire from. People from this program have never, ever let me down. They're always ready for the fight, intellectually honest, and compassionate friends. I am very fortunate to count many of the Baskin alumni as part of my personal tribe. Class of 2014, you are entering a time where everyone is looking for reasons to say no. No to finding solutions to poverty. No to comprehensive global health care. No to keeping our planet pristine for our children. Saying yes to tackling these problems will come from you. The diploma you're about to receive isn't just a certification of how good you are, it's a baton of trust given to you with the expectation that you will take on these challenges. It's now your show, and with God's speed, you will all open our eyes to a world of new wonders and solutions we never thought possible. Class of 2014, hear the no's. Expect the no's. Confront them, respect them, but do not accept them. Fight for yes. Class of 2014, I say yes to you. Good luck, Godspeed, and dare to be great.